Hello everyone, Heather Montez Ireland here, week five, and I'm going to be discussing three things, racism as an overt act and racism as a systemic practice that we're engaged in, how we see racism produced in the current socio-political moment, including the forthcoming election, for instance, and ways to intervene in these discourses and to combat racism in everyday life. So first and foremost, in thinking about racism, I like to use the essay by Amawale on Kintun Day, and I will provide a link to that essay below this video so you can read it yourself. Um, Akintun Day tells us that racism is not just something that happens or is performed by bad people. Um, he says, in fact, most white people conceive of racism like murder. The concept exists, but someone has to commit it in order for it to happen. And he tells us that this is a limited view of such a multi-layered syndrome, such as racism, that it cultivates the sinister nature of racism itself. Why? He says, well, if racism is conceived of as the conscious employment of certain acts using taboo terms, therefore, if one does not consciously perform those quote unquote racist acts, and if one doesn't utter those taboo terms, then one is able to assert that one is not really a racist. Yep, I'm not a racist, therefore, okay, the end. And that's not helpful. On the flip side of that, we can fall into the trap sometimes of saying, well, really, everyone's just a little bit racist. We can't possibly get a hold on it. It's just part of human nature. It just is. And that's not true either. So if it's not a conscious or overt act, per se, and if it's not something completely ephemeral, as in it's out there somewhere, um, what is racism then? Well, it's not individual, as Benny pointed out so aptly. Uh, though as individuals, we can surely engage racist systems and perpetuate them. Racism is systemic. And acknowledging the ways that racism is structural and institutional, the ways that race itself as an ideology structures our social worlds, and particularly in a U.S. context, it delimits which bodies have access to which resources. Racism is systemic, and we need to acknowledge the ways that we are situated in these systems. That is key. It's key to having conversations about race and racism, and it's also key to abolishing um, racism and working towards social justice. If racism is systemic, then number one, we're not post-racism. Ashley pointed the, the, this out in saying again, using the example of, of one black president, to say that, okay, thank goodness, we're done. Thank goodness, racism in, in, is in our past. Um, that's really wrongful thinking. Um, in fact, we've all heard it before, using the exception to the rule often just proves the rule, or it does prove the rule. So one black president out of 44 doesn't tell me that we are beyond racism, right? Or just using one person, one example here and there to say, well, look, one person had this or one person had that. Again, Ashley did a great job of explaining this. So you haven't listened to her post yet, make sure you do. Um, also though, race is not just black or white. And racism itself is not just encompassed by the dichotomy of black and white. Continuing to think about racism in this way hurts all people of color, but more so it upholds white supremacy. By making people of color choose to uh, support white supremacy rather than be marked as racialized, marked as black, as Andrea Smith tells us, only entrenches white supremacy. So we must think about power, privilege, and unearned advantage. Let's think about it for instance, in our current political moment. Racism doesn't just look like asking for our black president's papers and making him prove himself as a citizen that's racist, but in fact, in the recent political discourse and dialogue happening in the public sphere, racism comes out in the ways in which bodies are marked as poor and unworthy, um, worthy 
and hardworking or lazy, which bodies are seen as American or even as human. Racism intersects with classism, heterosexism, and misogyny to shape public policy, especially American public policy. And we must ask ourselves, who gets to shape that policy? And then who is on the receiving end of policies that are made not by members of our communities time and time and time again? If we understand the ways that racism, classism, and, and, and sexism, and these other forms of oppressions, the ways that they shape policy that then affects our lives, then we can understand that the stakes are high in working towards social justice, racial justice, gender justice. So knowing that the stakes are high and acknowledging that racism is systemic, what are we to do? First of all, if you're white, acknowledge your white privilege and acknowledge that racism exists. Sometimes this itself is a revolutionary act. However, that's not where your responsibility ends. If you're a person of color, don't distance yourself from other people of color. Stand in solidarity and refuse to be a participant in upholding the idea that whiteness is by nature superior and that white and Western cultures are naturally what we would all want to aspire to. Um, also, don't bask in your privilege while allowing others to be attacked while you stand silently and sometimes vocally by. So don't support policy that is racist and classist by design and don't contribute to the rhetoric that certain people, those people, are just lazy. They're just living off the government. They need to uh, be drug tested for welfare checks. Um, and all the various narratives that we hear that demonize um, the poor and working class, um, whether or not some of you identify as poor or working class, isn't the matter. Oftentimes, the middle class is implicated as well. Let's think critically about the ways that these issues are cloaked in language that dances around race, class, and gender just enough so as not to say it directly. Furthermore, don't allow race to be used as a wedge issue in organizing around class and labor rights or gender issues or sexual minority equity. Also, move away from biologically essentialist language about race. Don't ask multiracial, multiethnic people which part of us is which, for instance. And lastly, think about privilege and power and how to use your power for good rather than just feel guilty about it or lash out at other people for talking about it, or to dispute it. Next week, we'll be talking more about the ways that critical mixed race studies and multiracial slash multiethnic lives can reveal some additional, additional ways that racism is naturalized in our society, and to keep us mindful about the ways that race is biologized. Um, thanks for listening, and I look forward to talking to you next week. Bye-bye.